minutes of your time before we actually start the lecture at 6.15. You've got on your um, chairs a flyer for the next talk, which is about Combray, and you've also got a program for next year, um, which I hope you will enjoy and be able to come along and, and listen to. Leo Aylin on there is an ex-Green Jacket. He's a poet, and um, his talk reads quite interestingly. Uh, what it will be like, I'm not quite sure. He was a national serviceman um, and uh, slightly eccentric. I, I met him the other day, but uh, do go onto the internet, Google Leo Aylin and have a look. What he's going to say with a talk with a title like that, I'm not absolutely certain. Thank you, Reifman Bush, for delaying the execution, I think it was. Uh, bungling the execution, there you are. I can't even remember. Uh, it might, might be quite entertaining. A question for you. Uh, we have one more talk so far this year, but we have got um, the opportunity for a third talk, which uh, Heather, Heather Neden, who runs Hampshire Record Office, uh, I went along and listened to her talking about the Green Jacket Archive there. Uh, would you be interested in having a talk about the Green Jacket Archive and coming along? Yeah? Okay, I'll, I'll, I'll get something in, I'll get a date in, liaise with Heather, and then we can go from there. Um, we are also under new management this evening with the nibbles and the drinks. Um, the, the lady who runs what was Cafe Peninsula, now Copper Joe's, has taken on the mantle from John Davis, uh, and uh, I look forward to a really excellent round of drinks and nibbles, and I'm sure, I'm sure it'll be good. But it is the first evening, so if there are one or two um, slight delays or hiccups, then please, please uh, run with it. Always looking for more friends. If you have people who would like to come along and think to these talks and uh, would be interested, then do get in touch with them and add them on to the friends list. Just get in touch with, with the curator, uh, Christine Pullen, and we can add them on to the friends list and then they get the distribution of all the talks that there are. But this evening we're in for another treat. We have got uh, Andrew Lambert back again. His last talk on Jutta, and I was told just now, got 20,000 hits on YouTube, because the talks get put on YouTube. 20,000 hits is quite a lot. Uh, I wish we had a quid for each one of those <laughs> that went through. Um, we give 50 p to Andrew and then on from there. Uh, so uh, you're in for a treat this evening, talking about the Crimean War, uh, the part of the Crimean War that nobody really knows about. It's a strategic overview, and Andrew being a, a naval historian, uh, there's a, a lot of interest and emphasis on the naval aspects of it. So without further ado, Andrew, thank you very much for coming along again this evening. That's a very good pleasure, and <coughs> very pleased to be here again. The Crimean War is, as regular attenders at this museum will know, uh, a war which was fought in the Crimea by the British Army. Um, its main events included the charge of the Light Brigade, um, which was a heroic failure, Florence Nightingale, who saved the army from... Uh, destruction, uh, the invention of the raglan sleeve, the cardigan and the balaclava helmet, and the award of the Victoria Cross made from captured Russian guns. Almost all of these things are untrue, uh, but they are part of the <laughs> war. The VC was actually made from Chinese guns, as uh, we've recently discovered, captured by the Royal Navy. Uh, and the charge of the Light Brigade was not a failure, it was in fact a success, but we will get to that in the fullness of time. The Crimean War was not about the Crimea, it was about rather bigger things, as you might imagine. Britain doesn't go to war about a small piece of land on the other side of Europe, it goes to war with much larger targets. And what I want to get to this evening is why Britain went to war with Russia, but more importantly how it made war with Russia and what the outcome of the conflict is, because the standard version doesn't bother to get us to the peace process. It rather assumes that things went badly and the peace was not much better. This is not true. The theatre of the war that people are familiar with is, of course, the Crimea, Balaclava, Kersenis, Sevastopol, and up here, Yepatoria. Uh, and it was down this coast and along and around Sevastopol that the main events occurred. However, remember the Bosphorus, Constantinople, Istanbul, the Sioux Azov, Odessa, and out here in the mountains, Kars, the great fortress of the Turks on the frontier with Russia. The war was, of course, about something rather bigger. It was about the balance of power in Europe and beyond Europe. 
Britain and Russia were rivals in a long-standing Cold War that dated back to 1815 and probably dated back slightly further than that. The Russians had tried to interfere in our war with the Americans in 1812 as well. The British feared the Russians would get a grip on Central Asia and use that as leverage to get the British out of India and to undermine Britain's maritime empire by using overland military expansion. This was a classic whale versus elephant standoff between two very different powers, one liberal, democratic, progressive, industrialized, and rich, <coughs> and the other one exactly the opposite. Uh, there would only be one winner of this. Things were relatively balanced as long as the third party in this whole situation, the French, annoyed both the British and the Russians, which they normally did. Uh, but on this occasion, uh, the French managed to be on side with the British, and the Russians overplayed their hand, threatening to occupy Istanbul, thereby securing access to the Mediterranean for their Black Sea fleet. This was rather more than the British were prepared to tolerate. This would have cut into Britain's power in the Mediterranean, which was the basis of Britain's European stature. Control of the Mediterranean was Britain's European leverage. To make matters worse, a Russo-Turkish war broke out in October 1853. The Turks started it. They crossed the Danube and attacked the Russian fortress and defeated the Russian army. We often forget this. The war began with a Turkish victory over the Russians. There was also fighting on the Caucasus frontier, uh, right down there in the orange-green zone, and the Russians were keen to stop the Turks using their fleet to take troops from Istanbul all the way along to Sinope, and then through to Batum to launch them into the campaign zone. So late in the year, they sent their Black Sea fleet to Sinope, and here is the Russian Black Sea fleet destroying the Turkish force that's carrying troops to the front line. This is the Battle of Sinope, pictured here by the official war artist of the Russian Black Sea fleet. An artist well worth looking up, Ivan Avazovsky, a native of the Crimea. And here's another one of the Black Sea Fleet in Sevastopol Harbour, shortly before the war, including one of their early steamships. Like all Russian steamships, it was actually built in Britain. <laughs> Russians being a little bit backward. The fleet is important because it was this fleet that gave the Russians the strategic ability to dominate not just the Black Sea region, but also Turkey. The wind and currents in the Black Sea mean that a, a fleet carrying troops from Sevastopol would arrive in Istanbul long before any British or French force could come up from the Mediterranean. In fact, a matter of only two days. And the Russians had exercised this, and in 1833 they'd actually done it. They sent an army to Istanbul to defend the city against the Egyptians. Russians had form. They were quite good at getting men off ships because the Russian default position from a ship is to get on the beach very quickly because Russians don't like the sea. Most of them have never seen it before and they're not keen to be on it. This is why their elite naval formation is the naval infantry or marines because they get off the boat onto the beach and that is the Russian position. The strategic context of the war is that Britain and France eventually form an alliance. Britain and France are also in the middle of a very large naval arms race, building first-class steam-powered battleships against each other while deploying troops to fight the Russians. So this is a three-cornered fight, and nobody is quite on the same side. The Turks have their own view of the war, and the Russians certainly don't see the enemy as united. And I think this is an important point. It also reminds us that the way Britain makes war is different to the way that Russia and indeed France makes war. Russia and France are continental military powers. They see wars as matters of contest between large armies in so-called decisive battles leading to the overthrow of the enemy state and the imposition of peace. Britain doesn't do this. Britain fights long wars of economic endurance which bankrupts the enemy and persuades them to negotiate from a position of weakness. Now, this is the British way in warfare, and it's primarily maritime. The Army's role is amphibious power projection. The main task of the British Army in the 19th century was the destruction of the enemy's fleet and dockyards. And I've already given you a clue as to the main purpose of the Crimean War, <coughs> and there will be more of that to come. So we have two different means of making war in the same alliance, and this is a problem Britain has often faced. 
it goes to war alongside powers that see war in very different ways and have very different agendas. The war opened not in the Black Sea Theatre, but in the Baltic. Indeed, the largest British fleet in both campaigns was sent to the Baltic, because that's where the largest Russian fleet was. It's also where the capital of Russia happens to be. It's called St. Petersburg, and it's on the coast. Russia dominated the Baltic. It kept Sweden under control. Sweden owned Norway. Russia went all the way down to about here, with a little bit of Prussia up there as well. And the Prussians were also Russian satellites. The Baltic was essentially a Russian lake. It was a great interest to the British, both to project power against Russia and also to secure vital supplies, particularly of shipbuilding materials, from that region. So in March 1854, a large but newly raised and manned fleet, including steam battleships, was sent into the Baltic to stop the Russians coming out and to begin to impose some kind of blockade and to project power against them. <clears throat> this fleet was commanded by quite the most famous admiral in Britain at the time, Admiral Sir Charles Napier, who was the cousin of some other Napiers you've probably heard of. He's the son of the elder son of uh, Lord Napier. Charles Napier had a very long history of amphibious power projection command dating back to the Napoleonic Wars and the War of 1812. He is actually the man who fired the rockets in the American National Anthem, and he was also a pioneer of early steam navigation. He is now, as you can see from his dates, reaching the end of his career, but he is the obvious man to send on this mission. He has a relatively powerful fleet, but it's hampered by the fact that it was manned very late, and he's had no opportunity to take the fleet to sea and exercise it in even the most basic of station-keeping manoeuvres. So they're basically going to war and doing their primary training at the same time. The government thought it was a good idea to save a bit of money and not fit the fleet out earlier. Uh, this was a very bad move because it meant he spent the first three months of his campaign trying to stop his ships running into each other. <laughs> and the Baltic is not a good place to do this. It's relatively shallow, it's relatively rocky and quite a dangerous place to manoeuvre. <coughs> Napier's flagship, HMS Duke of Wellington, was the largest and most powerful warship in the world. 131 guns, steam power, moving at about 12 miles an hour and also a full sailing rig. Uh, on its own, it was probably equal to half the Russian Baltic fleet, combination of steam and superior firepower. So we went to war, and we made a terrible mistake. Our flagship was named after a soldier. Why, why should our flagship not be named <laughs> after a sailor? Surely we had one or two famous ones of those too. Uh, this was an accident. The ship was actually launched as HMS Windsor Castle on the very day the Duke of Wellington died. And in honour of his passing, the ship was renamed the day after. Uh, so the ship would have been named something else. The Baltic turned out to be a difficult theatre. The initial plan was that the fleet would sail into the Baltic, secure command, and then move up to the Russian port of Reval, or Tallinn as it is today, where a division of the Russian Baltic fleet would be found, and in the Baltic, the ice retreats to the east. So Reval would be open to attack before the other two Russian Baltic fleet bases at Helsinki and Kronstadt uh, were free. So ten Russian battleships could be taken out with a single strike. This plan had been written up in 1801 by Nelson. And it was widely known because it was published in Robert Southey's enormously popular biography of Nelson. But the Admiralty thought this was a perfectly valid plan, and so they picked Napier to conduct it. Of course, when they got there, the cupboard was bare. The Russians had also read the book. <laughs> <laughs> this meant that Napier's initial object in rushing into the Baltic had disappeared. Uh, the secondary problem was that the blockade he was meant to impose couldn't be imposed because when you buy goods from Russia, you buy six months in advance. You give the Russians the money, and they deliver six months later. So the, all of the cargoes of 1854 had already been paid for by the British. So it wasn't a good idea to destroy your own property in pursuit of economic <laughs> warfare. Economic warfare would start at the end of 1854, 
when the government reminded everybody that we were at war with the Russians and they were not to give the Russians any money for anything. <coughs> it proved to be very effective, but that's another story. The British and French uh, combined. The French arrived very late with some pretty ramshackle ships, uh, the British with some rather better ones. Uh, the ship in the foreground is HMS Edinburgh, which was designed uh, and built in the Napoleonic Wars, but had been fitted with a steam engine for coast assault purposes. 21st of June, 1854, a Royal Navy squadron bombarded the fortress in the Orland Islands, midway between Stockholm and Finland, a major Russian naval base in the making, and it was here that the first VC of the Crimean War was awarded. Mr. Mate Edward Lucas picked up a burning shell on the deck of his ship and hurled it overboard and was awarded the said decoration with a blue ribbon. Navy VCs had blue ribbons for a very long time. The bombardment did no damage to the fort, it has to be said. Uh, even the burning, I think, was <coughs> somewhat uh, overdone. Eventually, it was necessary to send an amphibious military force. As the British had sent their entire expeditionary force to the Crimea by this stage, the troops were French, 10,000 of them, and almost all of them new recruits. Uh, there were two regiments of regular uh, volunteers, and the rest were new, new raised men who all fell sick immediately. Here are the Orland Islands. Uh, there was a great naval base being built around this bay uh, with a major fort being constructed here, only part of which was built, and some lookout towers controlling the entrance from the sea. So there were three ways in, two of them were controlled. The Russians hadn't shut the back door, however, and the British, using steamships, managed to go in and outflank them. The troops were landed, batteries were built, the forts were knocked down, and that really was the end of that. It was a very easy victory, very few casualties, and therefore of no great interest to the press. Unlike the battles in the Crimea, where there were lots of casualties, and there was a lot to write about. Here is Admiral Sir Charles Navier, in his straw hat with a telescope and a rather snuff-besmirched handkerchief, uh, supervising the firing of a rifled 68-pounder at Bomasund. Uh, this was very much uh, what Napier was thinking of doing. The fort fell. This leveraged the Russians back into the Gulf of Finland, the narrow arm to the east of the Baltic, a very important strategic consequence. It also released Sweden from the grip of Russia. <coughs> this fortress and naval base kept Sweden under control. It was only 100 miles from Stockholm. Sweden could do nothing while the Russians were here. They were removed from this place and they never went back. Uh, the place was demilitarized at the peace process and it's the last stipulation of that peace treaty that still persists to this day. If you go to Orland, it's demilitarized and the Orlanders are very proud of that fact. They also <coughs> pretend they're not Finnish as well because they're all Swedish speaking. Even the French celebrated winning a naval battle, which for them is a rare occurrence, uh, by publishing a piece of work to show them fighting alongside the British rather than with them. Uh, you see in the background one of these towers, little round towers, a kind of super martello tower. <coughs> they proved to be utterly useless. Small battery of naval 32 pounders and they came down in huge sections. And here are the ruins of the main fort which the Allies then demolished using the Russians' gunpowder with a couple of British ships in the bay. This was the first victory of the Crimean War for, for the British and the French, and it's been entirely forgotten, unless you live in Orland, in which case you remember it quite well. To return to the Black Sea Theatre, the one that we're all familiar with. Initially, the British and French sent troops up to Scutari and planned to build lines across the neck of the peninsula here in honour of the lines of Torres Vedras. This is a war fought by old men who learned their craft in a previous war, 40 years earlier. The commander-in-chief, Lord Raglan, had lost his arm at the Battle of Waterloo, and the chief engineer, John Fox Burgoyne, had been heavily involved in the sieges of the peninsula. So the strategic pattern is being set from past precedent. The armies then moved up to Varna to flank any possible Russian advance through the Balkan Mountains towards Istanbul. They were based on the sea, and they would move inland if the Russians crossed the Danube. The Russians never got across the Danube because the Turks <coughs> stopped them. 
So the only bit we ever hear about the Turks is them running away at Balaclava. In fact, they fought very well throughout the war. The men who ran away at Balaclava were not Turks. They were Egyptians, and they were raw conscripts. Uh, they had no business in the front line. At this point, Austria, which is up here, tells the Russians to get out of what is now Romania, the Danubian principalities, this section, putting a cordon sanitaire between Russia and Turkey, so there's no point in the Allies remaining at Varna. There's also a massive outbreak of Asiatic cholera, which means the army is starting to die quite quickly. Uh, the cabinet, not the commanders-in-chief on the spot, decide that they will invade the Crimea. Lord Raglan doesn't understand why they're going, because nobody's told him his object is not to capture the Crimea, but to destroy Sevastopol. This is the only thing the army can do in the time available. It's the middle of summer in the, in the Black Sea. They can't go anywhere outside the Black Sea. There aren't any other obvious targets, so Sevastopol it is. An Anglo-French amphibious force of 50,000 men with a small Turkish contingent lands in the Crimea in early September and advances south from the beach, meeting the Russians at the Battle of the Alma, where the Russians are driven off the field, mostly by the sheer determination of the British infantry uh, and the flanking fire of British and French warships, and the rank incompetence of the Russian commander. Now, Prince Menchikov had a good idea how to win the campaign, but he thought that his job was to line the troops up on the battle and let his subordinates run it. Uh, they thought his job was to tell them what to do, so nobody did anything apart from the <laughs> Russian soldiers who fought bravely uh, but died in large numbers. The Russians were still armed with muskets. Most of the Anglo-French regiments had rifles. But this was a big advantage in an infantry firefight. At this point, General Burgoyne arrives in theatre and persuades the Allies that he is the man who knows how to win the campaign. The initial object of this grand raid was a 12-week smash-and-grab raid, capture Sevastopol, sink the fleet, blow up the dockyard, go home quickly. There was never any intention of staying in the Crimea over the winter. From the Alma, it's a simple march south to an unfinished fort commanding the high ground above Sevastopol, which is on the south side of the harbour. The French refused to attack the fort. <coughs> the French Marshal saint Dano, who was dying of stomach cancer, uh, when he wasn't on his dope, um, was a profoundly depressed man, uh, and he refused to attack the Star Fort. He said his conscript troops would not attack works armed with cannon. Burgoyne solved the problem by marching round Sevastopol and attacking from the south, where the Russians had more forts. He thought they had less, but of course he hadn't got very good intel. The British ended up with a base at Balaclava, which was a narrow, confined ditch, perfectly adequate to land the stores for a brief operation, but nowhere near big enough for a sustained campaign. The French took a different base, which was rather better. Burgoyne's plan was a regular siege. The second in command, Sir George Cathcart, said that storming the place immediately would be the cheapest and quickest method, and he was right. On the 17th of October, the Allies attacked with a combined land and sea attack. The navies attacked the forts at the entrance to Sevastopol Harbour, mostly to draw off the Russians, while the armies launched a full-scale bombardment and prepared to storm the Russian works. It all should have gone perfectly. It didn't. The Russians knew what was happening and opened fire on the French before the battle began and blew up their main magazine. The French were in no position to assault, and when Raglan tried to find the new French commander, Marshal Canrobert, Canrobert absented himself because he didn't want the British to take the city on their own. The French weren't ready to go. He wasn't going to let the British go without them. So having an ally can be a little bit of a problem. <laughs> Uh, the Allied fleets weren't told to desist from their attack, even though the land attack had failed, and so they conducted what was a, a very expensive exercise in demonstrating they had no ability to enter the harbour because the Russians had sunk their fleet to block the harbour mouth. Uh, some of the British ships, including HMS Rodney, seen here in the middle of the battle, uh, were quite heavily damaged, and quite a lot of lives were lost in a very futile exercise. As we know, the main layout of the campaign, Balaclava is the British base, Kamish is the French base, and here we have the siege lines around Sevastopol with the British in red and the French in blue. Sevastopol was never besieged. 
It was always open. The Russians could always bring in supplies from the north. They could bring them in across the harbour and from the end of the harbour. As the Russian brought up reinforcements, they launched a series of probing attacks, the best known of which is, of course, the charge of the Light Brigade, in which they attempted to draw the Allies down from the high ground, besieging Sevastopol, and break up their siege works before they could reach a critical point and break into the fortress. The charge is by far the best known incident of the war, and thanks to Lord Tennyson and a very bad piece of reporting by William Howard Russell, it's often believed that almost all the troopers were killed. This is not true. Uh, only 123 men were killed, wounded, or captured, and this was a lower casualty rate than the infantry regiments suffered at the Alma and the Inkerman. <coughs> Just over 600 troopers rode through a Russian gun line and drove off 2,500 Russian light cavalry. And this was far from a defeat. And had the heavy cavalry followed them up, as was originally intended, the entire Russian force would have been driven off the field in confusion. Instead, Lord Lucan, having sent the cavalry on a foolish mission, stopped the attack halfway through and called off the heavy cavalry, uh, which would have made it even more spectacular. But it's fair to say, after the Russians discovered the British were stone-cold sober, they never came out again on horseback to play cavalry. They were awestruck by the feet of arms of men who'd had nothing to drink but water. Uh, Russian troopers would only have done this if they were drunk. <laughs> they were also struck by the most amazing thing the British took to the Crimea, which was the quality of their horses. British cavalry horses at this period were several <coughs> decades ahead of everybody else's. Larger, stronger, and much faster, and greater endurance. These horses charge for 250 yards, uh, which is 10 times the distance horses of the cavalry were charging 100 years before. Not only that, but they retired in good order up the valley, uh, if not at a canter, certainly at a trot. So these were spectacular animals, and the Russians rounded up what few they could find after the battle and paid a lot of money for them, even ones with only three legs. These were quality breeding stock. And the horses of the heavy cavalry were even more impressive. But we won't get into that. So scientific horse breeding, that curious English obsession with animals, paid dividends. And these are the ancestors of all modern sporting and racing horses. The siege then settled down. The Russians made a major attack across the Inkerman ravine and up onto the high ground where they were driven off by brigade of guards naval reinforcements at one point captain sir william peel rn took command of the grenadier guards in the absence of any other officers and as he was the son of a prime minister they all followed him now, peel was awarded two vcs for his services in the crimea and he would have got another one for the indian mutiny but he died very great officer indeed the siege then settled down to a kind of mini First World War, grinding attrition, two well-supplied forces, lots of ammunition, bombarding, small-scale storming operations. The thing to remember here is, down here we have the Russian dockyard, and that is the target right up there. Six very large first-class dry docks, recently built by a British engineer who was in the British camp advising. Things started to go wrong when a major storm on the 14th of November destroyed the camp, much of the city, and sank the ships with the supplies which had already been sent out for the winter. The government had anticipated the needs, but the ships were not able to get into the small port of Balaclava and were destroyed. All of the greatcoats and reserve ammunition went to the bottom of the sea in a very short space of time. It was all replaced very quickly. In 1854, Britain was capable of doing amazing things. We invented the flat pack hospital. And Mr. Brunel designed a flat pack hospital, which was built and sent out in a matter of months. And then we come to Florence. Everybody knows the story of Florence Nightingale, the hero of the war in this modern post gender age. Florence Nightingale was the necessary hero of the war. In Britain, the middle classes don't go to war. Uh, 
middle classes read the newspaper. Uh, the aristocracy office of the war, the lower orders provide the foot soldiers, and the middle classes stay at home and make money. Uh, that is also part of the British way of war. So they needed a middle class hero to represent the non-combatant part of the effort. And the nearest they could get was Florence, who was a bit too posh to be middle class. But as her father wasn't a lord, they just about got away with it. And her great contribution was not saving the British army in the Crimea, because she didn't go there. It was eventually working out how not to kill them all. And she spent the rest of her life trying to make up for the mistakes she'd made in the great hospital at Scutari. At the times, needing a hero, and having already lambasted Lords Cardigan and Lucan for the charge of the Light Brigade, turned Florence into a heroine, and she became the international celebrity of the war. Uh, she didn't get to the Crimea until the middle of the next year, and immediately fell ill and had to be sent home. So her contribution to the Crimean campaign was zero. Uh, there were other contributions she made, but mostly of an administrative nature. She ran a very tight ship and took control of everybody else's voluntary nursing organisation. Uh, she was not somebody to cross, because the Prime Minister was a close personal friend. The solution to the great problems in the Crimea was not to press on with the attack. It was, in fact, to do something even more Victorian, which was to build a railway. So a light gauge railway was brought up into Balaclava and all the way up to the British camp. Ten miles of difficult, muddy track replaced by steam-powered rail lines. This meant the British Army was able to bring up flat-pack huts to improve the conditions of the men, improve the supplies, remove the wounded, and bring in artillery and ammunition, and vastly increase the firepower on display and overwhelm the Russian defences by sheer weight of metal. So this was a very Victorian piece of tactical work. Let's build a railway. When the war was over, the railway was taken to pieces and shipped to the Holy Land, where it connected Jerusalem with the coast. Nothing wasted. <laughs> the great problem is, of course, divided command. Here we see Lord Raglan, uh, like the Duke, pretending not to be a soldier. Uh, here we see the Turkish commander, who was actually a Croat, and the French commander, Marshal Pellissier, and they're disagreeing on how to fight a war. Pellissier wants to advance and find a large battle and win it. Uh, the Turks want to go off to the Caucasus because the city of Kars is under siege, and Raglan wants to stay as near the coast as possible so that the navy can take the army home if things go wrong. This is not a recipe for great success. However, there is a great success. In the spring of 1855, just as the campaign season reopens, an Anglo-French amphibious strike force captures Kerch and Yenikali at the entrance to the Sea of Azov, the little in landlocked sea behind the Crimea, across which all of the Russians' fodder, food supplies, and ammunition were arriving. And they were arriving by ship and boat. Capturing Kerch and Yenikali, the British then put a flotilla of gunboats on the Azov, and they destroyed all of the Russian ships, burnt all of their fodder stores, and basically ripped up the entire logistics base of the Russian army in the Crimea. Twelve gunboats, about 800 men. The kind of things they were doing, you see here at Taganrog, um, on, the, on the Sea of Azov, um, because the water is so shallow, they put together a raft floating on barrels to get their cannons close inshore, and then fired incendiary rounds into the Russian stores. Uh, several VCs were won here. This campaign settled the Crimean War in the Crimea. The Russians could no longer maintain their army with horses, and their ability to operate any cavalry disappeared overnight. They were now an infantry army desperately holding on to a very strong position at the end of a dead logistics line. They were running out of everything, food, <coughs> ammunition, equipment. This strike had killed the Russian army in the Crimea and forced it to admit it would have to surrender. Sevastopol fell on the 9th of September 1855 to a brilliant piece of innovative tactics by the French. The British once again attacked the Redan and failed bravely. Uh, the French attacked the Malakoff bastion, which was the key to the whole position, 
and they took it and held it. Involved an assault over a distance of 20 yards, and the Malakoff was taken because it was a very small position, and at midday the Russian garrison marched out and a new one marched in. And the French knew this, so they attacked at precisely midday and reached the front of the work just as the last Russian passed out of the door. They rushed in, shut the door, and held the position. And it was absolutely brilliant. Um, you have to hand it to them. They really were exceptionally good. Um, some French elite regiments in this campaign were outstanding. Some of the others were ordinary. After the battle, there was a question about what to do next. The army didn't do anything, but an amphibious strike force was sent to Kinburn at the mouth of the river Don, and not the river Don, at the mouth of uh, the river leading up to Nikolaev, the great shipbuilding center of the Russians. And Kinburn and Ochikov commanded this waterway. And um, an Anglo-French armada, including three armored floating batteries, the first time armored warships have been used in battle, destroyed Kinburn Fort, Ochikov was blown up, and the Allies advanced up the river as far as they could before they ran out of uh, naval fire support. This was a very important demonstration of new tactics for the assault and destruction of fortified works. And these fortified batteries are the immediate precursors of HMS Warrior. It's the same technology, four inch thick wrought iron plate, and these were impervious to Russian shock. Most of the firing was actually done by battleships, which were a little further off and literally knocked the fort down very <coughs> quickly. So after the battle was over, there was actually more fighting away from the Crimea. Here we are on the Caucasus front, and the Russians and the Turks, uh, we're coming down here. This is the great fortified city of Kars, which is the key to the whole position. Kars is on the top of a very high mountain, and it's almost impossible to attack it, but you can surround it. And so the Russians surrounded and starved the garrison into surrender. Uh, the Allies in the Crimea refused to release Omar Pasha's army to relieve Kars until Sevastopol fell, and this was the critical point. They arrived too late, and the Russians got a compensating victory from this, which they didn't, in all honesty, deserve. But to their credit, when the garrison surrendered, it was commanded by some Englishmen, as you might imagine, um, the Russians threw in supplies and relieved the starving men who'd already eaten their horses and anything else with four legs on they could find. They were starting to think about the unthinkable, uh, and then they surrendered. This pushed the Russian-Turkish frontier towards the Turkish side, but it was restored at the peace. <coughs> here we see the siege of Kars, and Kars is up here, and... Turks are down, the Russians are down here trying to get up there. So the fortress held out uh, for a very long time. It became something of a cause celebre that this city had fallen. And Fenwick Williams, the British officer who was in command, wrote a self-exculpatory account of the siege in which he blamed everybody else for its fall, uh, as you do. But of course, the Crimean War wasn't just fought in the Black Sea and the Baltic. It was also fought in the White Sea because the British strategy was to attack Russian naval bases wherever they happened to be. And the main base of the Russians in the north was Archangel, or Akhangelsk, on the White Sea, a major port exporting particularly timber, forest products, and iron to Britain. And in May 1854, a British squadron turned up in the White Sea and blockaded it. They didn't blockade it very thoroughly because all of the ships in Archangel were bringing home British goods, which had already been paid for. They would blockade it more thoroughly the second year. The plan in 1854 was to sail up the Davina River and burn Archangel, a very wooden city which would have gone up very nicely. Unfortunately, the ships in question were too deep drafted to get up the river. Instead, they attacked the town which has been replaced by Murmansk up here on the river. And they burned that to the ground, and that was the second time the British had burnt this place out. And the Russians never rebuilt it. So the Russian trade in the White Sea was crushed, they were driven back, and this was critical because the British were most anxious the Russians didn't move along the coast into North Norway to one of the ice-free ports, which would give them access to the Atlantic. So there's some grand strategy going on here, making sure the Russians don't gain advantages over Norway and Sweden. <laughs> And at the end of 1855, the British give Norway and Sweden a territorial guarantee. 
that they will defend these countries against Russia under any circumstances. And that guarantee still persisted in the First World War, and it shaped the strategy of the First World War because the British and French upheld it, despite the Russians being their allies. The high point of the 1854 campaign in the White Sea was a firefight between the British squadron, three sloops, and the Solovetskoy Monastery. Being a Russian monastery, it was heavily fortified and had a powerful battery of cannon. <laughs> Russian Orthodox priests are better gunners than most Russian soldiers. <laughs> and apparently the, the Archmandriate marched around the, the walls of the monastery with his icons and, and asked the, the Holy Father to uh, intervene and make sure the shells didn't strike the monastery. And indeed, most of them didn't. Nobody quite understood how it was that we ended up bombarding a monastery, but they started it. <laughs> Out in the Far East, there was yet another Russian naval base at Petropavlovsk. Uh, this is something you'll find in Russian naval history. They usually name a ship after Petropavlovsk. Uh, the harbour here has two Russian frigates, the Aurora and the Divina, inside it. And the British and French squadron want to get in the harbour and sink the Russian ships. So they stage an amphibious landing, and it all goes badly wrong. The Russians ambush them and drive them off. The day before this all happened, the British Admiral shot himself in his cabin, with fatal results, as a result of having to work with the French Admiral for three months. <laughs> <laughs> the Frenchman changed his mind so often, uh, and with such uh, vigour, uh, that he was utterly demoralised, and he, uh, the balance of his mind, as they say, was disturbed and shot himself. He confessed to his chaplain that he had indeed destroyed himself. Uh, this was something of a cause celebre. Yeah. When they went back the next year, the Russians had moved their ships, one of which was wrecked on the coast of Japan, and uh, the other one was wrecked in, in the Amur River. The main winners of the war in the Far East were the Russians, who seized a huge swathe of former Chinese territory, uh, the Soviet Far East around Vladivostok. This was all Chinese territory. The Russians grabbed it in 1856 as a result of the war. And I'm waiting for the Chinese to ask to have it back. Mm -hmm. The Chinese are in the habit of asking to have things back that people took from them, but they haven't got around to asking the Russians yet, which I think is interesting. In 1855, the British go back with, eventually, there's some French support to the Baltic Sea. This time, it's a proper blockade. It's stopping things coming out of Russia. Russia is an economy that relies on selling produce for cash. All the cash in the Russian economy comes from export sales. If the Russians can't export, there is no cash. If there is no cash, there are no taxes to be paid, the state has no money, and the war effort collapses. And the state goes bankrupt quite quickly. By the end of 1855, the Russian state would be functionally bankrupt. And Russian landowners, who relied on exporting their produce, also bankrupt. And there was no bread, and of course many of the peasants had been mobilized to fight in the army. It was a very unhappy country within six months of the blockade really starting. But the Russians had some friends, uh, the Swedish engineer Alfred Nobel and the German engineers, the Siemens brothers, had introduced them to the underwater mine. And they laid lots of these, both command mines and contact mines, in the approaches to their harbors. And here's HMS Merlin and Firefly setting two off. Merlin and Firefly are important. These are the vessels of the hydrographic officers who are surveying to plan the attack on Kronstadt. So this is why they're finding these things. The mines were then swept. The Royal Navy invented mine countermeasures in 1855. It involved matlows in rowing boats with grapnels. Uh, the admirals of the British squadron took a mine each and had a look at it. Uh, the commander-in-chief took the gunpowder out and then pressed the detonator and got squirted in the face with prussic acid. And the second in command was more enthusiastic. He pressed the button too soon and the whole thing went off and sadly killed a couple of Royal Marines and knocked one of his eyes out. That evening, the commander-in-chief wrote a dispatch back to London saying, a complete insight having been gained into the workings of these machines, they will cause us no further trouble. <laughs> and, and, and the campaign of 1855 was dominated by two critical factors. All the military resources had now gone to the Crimea, which was a campaign that had to be won. So any operation would be a purely naval operation. But there were now flotilla craft built for the war. Steam-powered gunboats with high-powered cannon 
and mortar vessels capable of firing high explosive bombs over long distances. The epicenter of the war would of course be the island of Kronstadt, the narrow shallow water passage, the deep water passage between Kronstadt and St. Petersburg and St. Petersburg itself, the capital of Imperial Russia. From his bedroom windows, the palace of the Peterhof, the Tsar could see the Allied fleet sitting off Kronstadt. So the war had been brought home to the Russians in a very immediate way. There were 300,000 first-class Russian troops guarding the Baltic coast. There were no elite Russian infantry or cavalry units in the Crimea. There were elite British and French units, but not Russian. The Russians had all their best people up here because this matters. The Crimea is not Russia. It's the edge of Russia. It's a long way away. It's several thousand miles away, in fact. Here are the British. Here is a drawing by the British of the main Russian forts, the Alexander and the Rizbank, and the Russian Baltic fleet anchored up in defensive positions with a British ship uh, close in. This was done on the spot by one of the British naval officers, all of whom, of course, have been taught to draw in an age before the camera was available. Instead of attacking Kronstadt, however, they only had enough flotilla craft to attack Sveabori, or Sveabori, the fortress at the entrance to Helsinki. Anybody been to Helsinki? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Get out to this one? <coughs> Mr. Trick, this is a magnificent place. This is the main entrance through which the great ferries come, and you can almost throw a stone from here to hit the ferry, and it's a very short distance across here. This was a major naval base and fortress, and in here uh, and along here were huge runs of sheds for coastal gunboats. <coughs> and there were very large powder magazines and other facilities. Fortress built by the Swedes in the 18th century, developed by the Russians. This was the key to the Gulf of Finland. Gunboats from here operating in the difficult coastal passages could really hamper naval operations at the high end of the Gulf of Finland around Kronstadt. So it was taken out early in August in a two and a half day bombardment. And here we see British gunboat. Uh, there is Helsinki. You'll, that's Helsinki Cathedral. And uh, they're firing into the city, uh, into the, the uh, fortress, and it's exploding. And that's what the original picture was. This is a bombardment of Seborg by William Carmichael. The flagship in the centre there is HMS Edinburgh, uh, flagship of the inshore squadron. And this is HMS Merlin, whose commanding officer had planned the whole operation. And this is one of the two magazines on Sveabori exploding. Every year, to celebrate this event, the Finns, who were not involved, have a firework competition <laughs> on Sveabori. Um, it was my great pleasure one year to comment on this and to pick the winners. <laughs> After this bombardment, in which not a single Allied serviceman lost his life, <clears throat> the newspapers were underwhelmed by such a bloodless engagement. Um, the Russians lost a lot, but nobody cared much about them. They were Russians. This allowed the Allies to move their force right up to the outskirts of Kronstadt and St. Petersburg and begin to plan what would happen in the following year, which was a full-scale assault on the island of Kronstadt, the largest <coughs> naval fortress in the world, leading to an attack on St. Petersburg. So the British, on the one hand, have broken the Russian economy. On the other, they're about to burn down the Russian capital city. What they're saying is, we fought this limited war. You've lost. You've lost Sevastopol. You've sunk your Black Sea fleet. Uh, we've got you bottled up in the Baltic. If you don't surrender, we'll just escalate a little and make it really hurt. If we burn down the capital city of your large multinational, multi-ethnic empire, it's probably not going to be good for imperial cohesion. All those non-Russian peoples are going to think about breaking away, particularly those regular rebels, the Poles. Uh, that Polish-Russian thing goes back a long way. And as Lord Palmerston pointed out, when the Poles eventually rose in 1863, he said, why didn't they do this seven years ago? <laughs> but they didn't. So the war in the Baltic puts huge pressure on Russia, and at the end of the year, in December 1855, the Russians begin to pull their ideas together about what's going to happen in 1856. And the conclusion is further defeats, further loss of territory, bankruptcy, uh, an inability to win the war, and possibly an inability to avoid losing it catastrophically, leading to the breakup of the empire, and they decide to accept the Allied terms, which are relatively moderate. For the Russians, 
the war has always been about heroic sacrifice, and this is part of the great diorama of Sevastopol that is in Sevastopol, painted in 1904, showing troops gathered behind one of the great bastions waiting for an allied assault. Uh, it's part of the hero story. Rus for the Russians, Sevastopol is a hero city from the 1850s and from the 1940s. At least a million Russians died fighting for Sevastopol in two major wars, and the idea that they were going to let anybody else have it, I think, is laughable. I had the good fortune to be in main building on the day Putin marched in, and I reminded them that this was a far too important an issue uh, to make a fuss about. During the attack, the Royal Navy that led to the final taking of the city. The Royal Navy was heavily involved, and these are mortar vessels firing 13-inch mortars with 200 pound exploding shell and these are quite effective at breaking things up and the British were very good at firing these into Russian reserve formations waiting to meet an assault by threatening to attack Sevastopol you draw the Russian reserves into open ground and then you'd attack them with mortar fire uh, very clever stuff and here are the French um, crowing over their victory one might say uh, this is a British picture, so we, we were quite happy the French had taken Sevastopol. We were a bit sore that we hadn't taken the Redan, though. And that's why there's so many pubs called Redan, because it's about drowning your sorrows. <laughs> so if you've had a bad day, go to the Redan, because that's the place to think about uh, those things. Sorry. Don't think we need that. The war ended in March 1856 with a peace process at Paris presided over by Louis Napoleon III, who, through the victory of his troops, had made himself the arbiter of Europe, the most important man in Europe, the dominant figure in European politics. He just stayed, he was staging a great exhibition, the second, following the 1851 exhibition in London, and a son had just been born to him, which established his dynasty that would, he hoped, endure forever. So he was right on top of the world in 1856, and he presided over the, a peace process in which the Russians caved in, but the French made sure they didn't cave in too far because the French would need the Russians to back them up against the British before too long. <laughs> so there's a great deal of horse trading going on here, and the main outcome of the war was almost certainly the creation of modern Italy. Uh, but that's another story involving the emperor and the niece of an Italian politician. Nothing changes in French politics. <laughs> <laughs> on St George's Day, 1856, the uh, 23rd of April, uh, as you, I'm sure, all know, uh, the British celebrated their victory, and victory it was at Spithead, uh, with this wonderful uh, bird's-eye view of an enormous fleet. Not the fleet from the Black Sea, but the fleet intended to sail to the Baltic in 1856 and destroy Kronstadt and St. Petersburg. A fleet with over 200 gunboats, 150 mortar vessels, 10 armoured batteries, floating workshops, uh, a steam-powered battle fleet, 15 strong, and a full panoply of warlike material. These vessels were not just anchored up, but they manoeuvred under steam and carried out a mock assault on South Sea Castle to demonstrate what they were about. A lot of powder was fired, uh, but no shot. The Queen was present, so were the Houses of Parliament and the foreign dignitaries of the Ambassadorial Corps. Mm -hmm. With the exception of the American, who decided this was a good thing to miss. The object of the exercise was to tell the rest of the world that if they messed with the British, the Royal Navy would come and smash down their, cap their coastal cities and destroy their economy, so they'd better watch out. This is called deterrence, and it's the reason why Britain didn't go to war with another major power until 1914. The only problem with deterrence is you can only deter rational, logical people, and in 1914, the Germans were neither. This occasion is absolutely axiomatic to understanding what the Crimean War is about. It's about preserving Britain's ability to operate on very low defence spending as a global power, protecting its global trade, promoting its economic interests, and its ability to keep Europe stable, balanced, and not necessarily combined against the British. Uh, all of these things are pretty much covered here. It's not a hugely accurate picture, but that doesn't matter very much. So the symbolism of this event, the Royal Yacht Victoria and Albert, HMS Duke of Wellington with the flag up, 
and a huge force of gunboats really matters. Five years later, the United States government, the Union government, picked a fight with the British over international maritime law, the famous Trent Crisis. The Americans backed down when they heard that Portsmouth Dockyard had been put on double time to mobilise the gunboat fleet. They knew what it meant, and they backed down. The American ambassador told President Lincoln that the British were serious. The signalling was really very clear. Double time in the dockyards, announced in the Times, paper of record, diplomatic victory. The Russians, of course, restored their dockyards in Sevastopol. Here's uh, Pamir Azova in the dockyards in the late 19th century after the, they'd been rebuilt with a, an old pre dreadnought battleship there. So the Russians rebuilt the dockyards, but <coughs> the British had kept them out of the Navy business in the Black Sea for 30 years. They preserved Turkey, which survived in its Ottoman form down to 1922 and has survived ever since. The Russians never got to India. They got to the borders of Afghanistan in 1884. What happened? The British mobilized a large fleet at Spithead and told the Russians, and they backed down. They advanced into the Balkan Mountains in 1877 and defeated the Turkish army, and the Royal Navy turned up at Istanbul and the Russians backed down. There's an important pattern emerging here. The Crimean War is the basis for holding off the Russians, the Americans, oh, and the French, Big crisis with the French over Fashoda, 1898. British mobilized the fleet and the French surrender. 1914, didn't mobilize the fleet. We couldn't, it was already fully mobilized. And nobody bothered to tell the Germans what we were doing. So we possibly missed a trick there. So there is a Crimean War, we all remember, with the French on the top of the heap um, and some guardsmen just outside Waterloo Place, but it's not the Crimean War. It's a very small theatre at one end of a very large war which is fought around the globe. The war is not won by defeating the Russians in the Crimea, although the objective of blowing up their dockyards is secured. The war is won by breaking their economy and forcing them to face up to the possible destruction of their capital city and the downfall of their imperial system. Uh, wars are not won by battles, wars are won by larger means, of which economics and industrial output are critically important. This is the war that saw the first use of mass-produced infantry small arms. By the end of 1855, British units are using Enfield rifles, which are mass-produced. They're also using mass-produced steam engines in their gunboats. And they're starting to use some very interesting technologies, including the submarine telegraph cable, which means London and Paris can interfere in command decisions in the Crimea. They're using steam-powered shipping, and they're using armoured warships, and the Russians are using underwater mines. We're well on the way to the First World War here. So although they're wearing brightly coloured Napoleonic uniforms, this is the cusp of a mass massive transition. Who was paying attention to this war? Funnily enough, the Americans. They sent a high-powered military mission to the Crimea, and wrote a huge report called The Art of War in Europe, which was published in 1861, dedicated to Jefferson Davis, who was the Secretary of War. One of the chief authors of that um, report was George McClellan, who would command the Army of the Potomac in the American Civil War. There's very little in the American Civil War that wasn't first seen here. Um, the two things that are probably most significant are the first use of machine guns and the tactical use of barbed wire. Uh, but the Americans had to bring something to the plot. Uh, they didn't bring half as much as they claimed they did. So the Crimean War was not about the Crimea. It was not settled in the Crimea. It wasn't started in the Crimea. And at the end of the day, it was an Anglo-Russian war to determine who was the great power in the Eurasian landmass and around its margins. And the British won because they persuaded the French to do most of the heavy lifting on land. And that is the way the British should fight their wars by finding somebody else to do the heavy lifting on land with support from the British. Those 50,000 Allied troops who landed in September 1854 were split 50-50. By the end of the war, the British contingent had got up to about 45,000, and the French had a quarter of a million in the Crimea. That's about right. They had plenty of people to spare, and the British did not. It was not Britain's business to do that. We raised mercenary regiments, we offered enlistment bounties, but we didn't conscript anybody. 
fact, we didn't conscript anybody to fight the other Napoleon either. These men are all volunteers. It's a very small army in support of a very different kind of strategy. And going into the First World War, the strategy has not changed. Britain is still anticipating fighting the same war with the same mechanisms. Things do change, but that, as they say, is another subject. Thank you very much. Andrew, thank you very much indeed. Questions? We've got about 15 minutes. Claire. Professor, what was the war called by the journalists at the time? And why is it that 160 years later historians are still calling it the Crimean War? Thank you. When I wrote my PhD on the Baltic campaigns of the Crimean War some years ago, uh, it was called Great Britain and the Russian War in the Baltic. Because at the time, it was the Russian War. All the journalists at the day spoke of a Russian war. Because they knew this was a global war, and it was fought against Russia. It was not fought in the Crimea, it was fought in many different theatres. It became the Crimean War at about the time the last few troopers from the charge died. Because Florence Nightingale was still alive, got into the 20th century, but the last few troopers from the charge died. And the Crimea it was the only bit of the war anybody <coughs> remembered. And there's a very important reason for this. Alexander Kinglake wrote an enormous book, which everybody thinks is about the Crimean War. It's in seven massive volumes, and it took most of his life to write it. It's very dense, but it's beautifully written. Kinglake's a fine prose stylist. But it's not about the Crimean War at all. It's the history of the invasion of the Crimea down to the death of Lord Raglan. It's just an operational history of one campaign in a much larger series of events. Furthermore, the object of the book was to rescue Raglan's reputation, which had been unfairly trashed in the press, uh, and the fact that he was dead and couldn't answer back made it all the harder. And Kinglake expressly said that he was going to make this a modern Iliad. This was going to be the story of a long siege waged by the good guys to overthrow the city of the bad guys. With Lord Raglan, um, a pensioner, and a disabled one at that, uh, playing the part of Achilles, a teenage psychopath. <laughs> um, it doesn't work. You, know, you can't make Lord Raglan into Achilles. You know, it's, he's not known to have ever killed anybody, although he might have jabbed somebody quite sharply uh, in a written minute. Uh, he was not that kind of soldier. And nor was he that kind of man. So the Crimean War is created by a misunderstanding of a very large book which dominates the Victorian imagination of this war by the memory of Florence Nightingale, who's associated with a place she visited very briefly, uh, and by that great event, The Charge, and Lord Tennyson's famous poem, which was written on reading William Howard Russell's inaccurate report of the event. Howard Russell got his hands on the muster that was taken immediately after the charge, which showed 123 men. And he reckoned that these were the only survivors, and therefore all the others had been killed. Of course, that wasn't it at all. Most of the rest were still wandering up the valley because their horses were either dead or disabled. And they didn't muster back until some time after this. Uh, the final muster is far more impressive. So the Crimean War takes over because it's the only bit anybody bothers to remember. And sadly, the only reason they remember it is because it was a mess uh, and a lot of lives were lost. The things that happened in the Baltic are, in many ways, far more significant and cost almost nothing. Uh, quite a lot of tons of gunpowder and, and shot and shell, but in human terms, insignificant. Even the cholera outbreak in the Baltic was tiny compared to the one in the Black Sea. So this is a war which is remembered for the human cost, not the consequence. And there is a danger in the writing of history and the retelling of the past that we confuse those two things. The fact that the Crimean campaign cost a lot of blood, as well as treasure, does not make it more important than a campaign that didn't. And we need to know why it cost that much. And one of my students had just produced a masterful account of the medical history of the army in the Crimea, which basically suggests that the problems were solved relatively easily solved as soon as they accepted they weren't on a short-term raiding operation, we're actually there for the long haul. Uh, 
and brought up the proper support. So we need to get away from this idea that because it was expensive, it's important. And we've seen that with the celebrations and commemoration of the First World War. We tend to fixate on the really unpleasant, messy bits of the war and forget the really clever bits. Um, we ought to do the other way around. What we want to remember is how to be clever, not how to make a mess of things. Uh, it's important we remember what happened, but it's also important we remember how to avoid doing it again. You know, the only point of history is to make sure we don't repeat our mistakes, at least not knowingly. These are uh, 200-pound mortar shells. Do yeah. they have a variety of um, ordnance that they could use, and what effect would firing these things have on the vessel that was carrying Yeah, the 13-inch the sea service mortar, you'll see two or three of them at Fort Nelson if you're ever up there. Um, very large mass of cast iron. The shell is, is obviously a hollow projectile with about 12 or 14 pounds of powder in it. You can also put combustibles, um, essentially materials designed not to be put out. So you can use it for blast effect or you can use it as a combustible, a combustible weapon. It will be backed up by large scale use of rockets and also long range rifled artillery that like us a 68 pounder. At the siege of, at the bombardment of Sveborg, the Russians stopped firing back after about 10 minutes when they realized the Allied vessels were too far away and they simply couldn't hit them. So this is a very one-sided competition. This is clever war. Our weapons are so much better than yours, you can't even shoot at us. Uh, their main job was to destroy large fortified masonry works. And the great forts at Kronstadt, which are three and four batteries of granite, one on top of the other, were desperately vulnerable to plunging fire, which would reach down into the magazine and blow the whole thing up. So this is a very powerful piece of ordnance. And they were mass produced in Britain when the war broke out. And they were a consumable store. You fired them until they stopped being very safe, and then you threw them away and used another one. Uh, so many different charges could be used in them. And, of course, you adjust the range by adjusting the powder charge. You don't change the elevation of the, of the weapon. You just put more or less powder in. So if you want, really have to go a long way, you put more. And you mentioned that they used them on um, reinforcement formations. The, the mortar vessel is a, is a very dense mass of timber, which is designed to absorb this solid downward pressure. These are the vessels that were sent to the Arctic. Sir John Franklin's Erebus and Terror were mortar vessels. Terror, in fact, took part in the bombardment of Baltimore in 1814 and fired the bombs in the air in the American National Anthem. So these, these vessels had a long history. In the Crimean War, they also made iron mortar floats. Um, with suspension. They started to work out how to damp out the effects of these enormous blasts. And an engineer called Mallet built a 36-inch mortar, firing an enormous shell. And it was made in pieces held together by bands. And again, if you go to Fort Nelson, it's right outside with some of the shells. 36-inch, a yard across. One was made to bombard Sevastopol and one to Kronstadt, and the one at Kronstadt was going to be mounted on a vessel. Now, the Victorians had no doubt they could solve anything with heavy engineering. Yeah. And Mr. Brunel offered them the design of an ironclad gunboat. Um, they didn't take that one up. He did make a contribution to the next generation. He's responsible for the armoured turret. Not the turret, but the turntable. All those early turret vessels, the turntable is a railway turntable for turning the engine round. Mm -hmm. Really simple piece of engineering. Next one. And then. Professor, you paint very clearly the, the threats to Britain or what we perceived as the threats um, to us posed by the Russians with India and the economy. But how did we, or how were the French persuaded? What were the, the threats um, to the French? Uh, were they different? Were they the same? Or how did we yeah, thank you. the politicians persuade the French to come in with us? Mm -hmm. The simple answer is we didn't. The French wanted to come in. Louis Napoleon Bonaparte in 1851 has overthrown the constitution and declared himself <coughs> emperor. And in order to sustain his power, he needs to project what Bonaparte's <coughs> project, which is military prowess. He needs to be a great military figure like his uncle. Of course, he isn't. Um, he's a reserve artillery officer of no great moment. But he has the army behind him. And basically, Louis Napoleon is using the army to boost his prestige. The army is using Louis Napoleon to boost its prestige because both of them feel that they've 
are the losers of the last great round of wars. And so the French army wants to recover La Gloire. And the French don't have any strategic objectives. They just want to get their mojo back. Yeah. They want to be the top dog again, and the only way to do that is to fight a great war against a great army with a big reputation and defeat them. Uh, within four years, they've also knocked over the Austrians, and ten years after that, they have a go at the Prussians, and that doesn't end so well. But that's what it, it's about prestige and power and image. It's the French are fighting for something intangible. You know, they're the great guys for adjectives. When you look at the list of the Royal Navy and you find all those great adjectives like invincible and courageous and renowned and glory, they're all French prize names. Englishmen don't use names like that. Yeah. They use much more straightforward names. So for the French, it's about prestige. And they get sucked into this war because they want that prestige. They're sucked into fighting it to the finish because that's what they want. But by the fall of Sevastopol, they know they've got everything they're going to get out of this. And... They, they want out. They pull out of the war. And so the British threat to attack Kronstadt isn't an Allied threat. It's a British threat. That fleet is all British, and it's going to do the job on its own. The British need something at the peace table where we can say, we can do this on our own. We don't need the French. Don't need any soldiers. Don't need any of that. We can do this from the sea with our own resources. And that's what that great Spithead review is all about. So the French are very useful uh, as armies are always useful to the British because we never have enough soldiers um, but it's better that they lost a quarter of a million men than we did I think you were just a little unfair in the beginning of your talk in suggesting that Russian sailors only wanted to be back on shore well, I was in St. Petersburg and Kronstadt about two weeks ago with a team of Arctic convoy veterans from this side enjoying ourselves in the company of our opposite numbers on the Russian side and uh, I don't think they would like that remark too much. I'm sure they wouldn't, but you might ask them how many Russian ships were involved in escorting the Arctic convoys. Indeed. You would find the answer is none. Well, one. One, yes. One we gave them and they took it home. One we built them. Yes. The Russians sent a destroyer out to escort an Arctic convoy and it was overwhelmed by the ocean and sunk. Mm -hmm. um, the Russians have never been natural seafarers. They try very hard and... In their element, they are very good. If you want to go on an icebreaker through the Arctic, the Russians are by far the best. Uh, nobody is anywhere near as good as the Russians in Arctic ice navigation. Uh, but they are not natural seafarers. Um, and the Russian Navy has never been what Peter the Great wanted it to be. Um, they're brave fellows, but that isn't their natural element. Um, and the reason... Uh, I've been to these things before. Uh, the reason they're so keen on celebrating Arctic convoys is because they know that all of this was brought to them and delivered to them at Archangel of Momansk. They didn't come and get it. Uh, they didn't have the capacity to come and get it. Uh, they sent a few merchant ships out, but that's about it. It's interesting that the supply route was through the back door across Lake Ladoga. Uh, yes, into, into St. Petersburg. Of course, we all forget that most of the supplies actually went through Persia because there was no trouble getting supplies through Persia. As long as we held the Indian Ocean, most of those supplies are coming up from the south. It's only the early stuff which is really important in the Battle of Moscow. But after that, the bulk of the supplies is coming that way and from the Americans across the Bering Straits. Mm -hmm. um, the Arctic convoys, are, again, we remember those because they're very dramatic and quite expensive. And they're very good PR to show the British are doing something. But everybody forgets the really relatively peaceful mission to go all the way into the Persian Gulf and send supplies overland from there. And the Russians didn't give anybody a medal for that, just for the Arctic convoys. We, of course, didn't give anybody a medal for the Arctic convoys until very recently, uh, despite them being by far the greatest achievement of the Royal Navy, probably in its entire history, uh, to defeat the enemy's submarines, aircraft, and surface ships, and the weather. Um, is a pretty formidable achievement. Um, the Navy staff after the war looked at the Arctic convoys and said if the boot had been on the other foot we would have stopped them they would never have got through you know, there, there was no way that this is possible um, the Germans failed badly they had all the tools at their disposal and still lost the game I think we've got time for about one more question <coughs> who would you credit for the strategic thinking in this era 
Strategic thinking in this era, thank you very much. That's a very good question. The driving force for the making of the strategy of the Crimean War is, is a politician, uh, Sir James Graham, who was then uh, First Lord of the Admiralty, uh, of regrettably a long defunct office. We ought to have a First Lord of the Admiralty. Uh, Graham is a student of war. He's been First Lord of the Admiralty before. He knows a lot of senior officers on, of, of both colours. And he is the one who puts together the strategic memorandum which the cabinet agree on in January 1854. And that is the basis for pretty much the entire war. Uh, the memorandum includes, includes some colourful language. And he says, referring to Sevastopol, the eye tooth of the bear must be drawn. Now we know what the British think the Russian fleet is. It's canines and incisors. Um, it's an offensive instrument designed to damage Britain's interests. And if we pull this thing out by sacking the dockyard, this is a good thing. So that's where the, the whole thing comes together. He's taking advice from a lot of people and his correspondence with serving officers and veteran officers from the previous Baltic campaigns against the Russians between, in 1807 through to 1812 really very important. Uh, one particular officer, Sir Thomas Byam Martin, who was by then Admiral of the Fleet, a very great officer indeed, provided him with some excellent advice on the Baltic theatre. He also made sure that the Commander-in-Chief had access to the journals of previous Baltic Commanders-in-Chief. So very much a learning exercise. Not only are they reusing Crime uh, Napoleonic War precedents, but they've got the Napoleonic <coughs> correspondence in their hands to actually work their way through. So this is a, very much a campaign shaped by past experience. <coughs> it's also heavily influenced by hydrographic knowledge. Um, I probably ought to have said more about this in the, when I was uh, going earlier. The hydrographer of the Navy until the war breaks out is the well-known Sir Francis Beaufort of Windscale fame. Beaufort ran a brilliant operation exchanging British charts with everybody else. So all of the British charts that are used in the Crimean War, in the Black Sea, in the Baltic, in the White Sea, and parts of the Pacific, they're all Russian charts. And they're converted into English measurements and given <coughs> English language uh, information, and they are done in the order they're required. So the Black Sea charts are done first, then the Baltic charts, just in time for March when the British go to the Baltic, the White Sea charts are issued at the beginning of May, just as the squadron sets off when the ice is clearing in the far north. And Beaufort says to his fleet survey officers, uh, and all of the fleets have a high-powered survey officer or two, uh, whatever you do, check these before you use them. You do not operationalize this intelligence until we've proved the Russians haven't sold us a line and that these are, in fact, unsafe charts. The charts were good. The Russian charts were fine. And you will find, if you go through the the British charts, for example, the Baltic, that the original chart is followed by another one with the names of the officers who were there, and it says this chart from the Russian, corrected by Captain Sullivan uh, and Captain Otter, and these are the two fleet survey officers. And Sullivan, who planned the attack on Sveobori and the, the attack on Bomersund, and was planning the attack on Kronstadt, was still advising the government on strategy in the Baltic in 1877. So the Napoleonic era veterans had gone, but the Crimean War veterans were still there. The Baltic is the first campaign for Jackie Fisher mm -hmm. and his right-hand man, uh, Admiral Sir Arthur Wilson. They both went into the Baltic, and they both went into the Black Sea as well. So this war is, is, a, is a critical turnover <coughs> point between the last of the Napoleonic era and the first of. I'm, I was reminded of this as I walked in, walked in this evening. Uh, you've got... Uh, Lord Seaton out there, who if he'd been five years younger would have commanded instead of Raglan. And I suspect would have made a rather better job of it. Uh, Seaton knew how to command men. Raglan had never commanded men in his entire career. And your late 60s is a bit late to take on new tasks like that. He was a great staff officer, but he had no combat command experience. And this caused some problems with his juniors who did particularly with Sir George Cathcart, who had a, a commission to take over if Raglan was killed. Uh, Cathcart himself, of course, was killed at Inkerman, 
because he was a vain man and wouldn't wear his spectacles. <laughs> uh, he mistook some Russians for guardsmen. <laughs> he got close enough, the Russians shot him. And he's buried on General's Hill with several other short sighted British commanders. <laughs> I think on that note, we've, we've got to pull the plug in. I was, I was gazing at the portrait of Seaton to see if he started smiling or, uh, yeah. or wondering uh, if, if Wellington had been alive, whether Wellington would actually have uh, allowed him to become Commander in Chief after the way he treated him at Waterloo. But were, that's another story. Yes. <laughs> um, ladies and gentlemen, I hope you enjoyed that. Frankly, I learned an awful lot. Yeah. And um, several of my sort of dearly held beliefs about going on the Crimea have been blown out of the water, I think would be about the right uh, expression to use here. Very good. But Andrew, thank you very much indeed. That was absolutely a tour de force. Your grasp of of um, the detail and your overview and your delivery. Absolutely magnificent. Thank you very much indeed for coming down and speaking. Thank you.